The next polymer that we're going to be looking at as we continue our discussion on biological molecules are proteins. And proteins, we want to make sure we have this written very clearly, are also polymers. And we'll explain why using the information about proteins that we know so that we can more better understand the idea of polymers and proteins. So, with any polymer, we always should start off by looking at the monomer. So what's the monomer of a protein? So let's write this down. Monomer equals, and this is known as an amino acid. Amino acid. And there are actually 20 amino acids, and we'll see why there are 20 in just a second. So the amino acid has a very specific structure that is seen throughout every single amino acid, and we'll talk about it right now. First and foremost, every amino acid has what is known as an alpha carbon. And if this hasn't been clear before, um, you write alpha, the Greek letter alpha, like this. And you write the Greek letter beta like this. So alpha, beta. So an alpha carbon is present in the structure of every single amino acid. In addition, there's always going to be a lone hydrogen present in the structure. There's also going to be, and this is where the name comes from, an amino group within every single amino acid. And if we remember, the amino group is going to provide us a basic or acidic nature. And if we remember back to our lecture, an amino group NH2, such as this, is a proton acceptor. Remember, it can turn into NH3+, so this is going to be a basic amino group. And in addition to that, there's going to be a carboxyl group interestingly enough, and if we remember the carboxyl group, remember in the ionized and non-ionized form, a carboxyl group is usually actually going to be acidic. So now we have a basic component and an acidic component to this amino acid alpha carbon chain. And the last and probably most important thing of the structure is the R group. The R group is denoted um, as simply the group that's going to be varying. Is This is our varying side chain within every amino acid. And can you guess how many different types of R groups there are going to be R? If everything is the same in every amino acid except for the R group, the carboxyl is going to be the same, the amino is going to be the same, the H and the alpha carbon are going to be the same. The R group, if there are 20 amino acids, there are going to be 20 R groups, so 20 types. So that goes for our structure of our amino acid. What about the characteristics of the amino acid? What is this structure allow the amino acid to sort of do. So this is an extension of the amino acid. Let's look at um, some characteristics of amino acids. Structure and function are intimately related in biology, so structure and characteristics. The structure is going to specifically focus and involve the characteristics that we see. So one thing that we'll see is that every amino acid or most amino, some amino acids actually, excuse me, are going to be nonpolar. Some amino acids are going to be polar, and this is going to be a little confusing at first, but I'll explain it in just a second. Some are going to be uh, electrically charged, electrically charged, and some are actually uh, going to be uh, essential amino acids, and we'll explain that in just a second. So these are basic characteristics. Amino acids from this point forward will be denoted by double A. So some are nonpolar, some are polar. How is that possible? It's of course possible because of, guess who? These R groups. These R groups allow it to be polar or nonpolar dependent on the R group itself. So think of something that we've covered that's nonpolar. What's nonpolar? A hydrocarbon. So a hydrocarbon R group, let's write that down as hydrocarbon R group, will be a nonpolar amino acid because the R group denotes what amino acid we have. So if you attach an R group, onto the alpha carbon, onto the carboxyl area and the amino and the H, you're going to get a hydrocarbon R group, let's say. You're going to get a nonpolar amino acid. What about a polar amino acid? Let's say you have an R group, but this time the R group has with something that's polar, a hydroxyl, right? Hydroxyl um, uh, R group. Let's say a hydroxyl R group or a hydroxyl within the R group. And if we remember, a hydroxyl was what? Hydroxyl was OH. Why is this polar? Because it has the O, and the O is what? Electronegative, and the electronegativity means that it's going to hog those electrons a little bit more than others. So a hydroxyl R group is going to promote a polar amino acid. An electrically charged amino acid 
is going to usually then be hydrophilic actually. It's actually usually hydrophilic, so we can have hydrophilic amino acids. We can also have hydrophobic amino acids right over here. Um, in addition, uh, because electrically charged means two things, you can either have positively charged or negatively charged amino acids. If it's positively charged, we expect it to be basic. And that's usually an amine group right over here. We usually expect this to be, let's say, NH3 positive. If we see an NH3 positive, we're going to have a basic amino acid. If we see something like, let's say, an acidic carboxyl, so acidic for the minus sign, something like a carboxyl group, and if we remember what a carboxyl group was, that was COO minus, remember that from our uh, previous lectures. This is going to make something acidic. So this is an acidic amino acid. And essentially an amino acid means that this is going to be an amino acid that we get from diet. Our body is able to make some amino acids on its own by just using the material that we have within ourselves. But some amino acids we cannot make. They are essential to us and they have to be eaten from our diet. In addition to the amino acid uh, structure and characteristics, structure and function, let's just quickly talk about the formation of proteins. So now that we understand what the monomer is, the whole story behind the amino acid, let's make a polymer, let's make a protein. So let's talk about formation. Formation, of course, it's going to be linked together via a nice strong bond. What is that strong bond? Covalent. So link, linked via covalent bond. But we want to be specific. What type of covalent bond are we going to create? We're going to create a covalent bond, but this covalent bond is going to be called a peptide bond. And if we remember, I just want to make sure we understand this linkage occurs via what? Linked via covalent bond, but this covalent bond comes from, and I forgot to mention this, comes from what type of reaction? From a condensation reaction. And a condensation reaction involves the addition or loss of H2O. Of course, the loss of H2O. So we're going to lose H2O when we make a peptide bond. Let's just show that right now. I have an amino acid. I'm going to have another amino acid. Well, that's the monomer, right? Mono, mono. One amino acid, one amino acid. I'm going to put them together via condensation. So I'm going to write condensation right here. And what is also going to happen here? I'm going to lose H2O. So I'm going to throw H2O out of this. And that's going to give me... AA combined to AA. This is now going to be a dipeptide. Dipeptide. Two peptides. And so this dipeptide is linked together. What is this called right here? This is, of course, our peptide bond right there. This is our peptide bond. Um, we have a dipeptide. And we also are going to release H2O. Remember, we're going to release H2O back into the environment somewhere. So this is how we make our amino acid. And then, of course, if we wanted to break it down, we would break it down by throwing in H2O through a process known as hydrolysis. Hydrolysis will also break this down. And in our next video, we'll cover what a polypeptide is and also what that denotes in terms of protein structure.